Thank you all for joining. It is a pleasure. My name is Daniel, as, I, as we've been talking, and I am Hospitable's Community Events Coordinator. I'm excited to welcome you to Hospitable's Industry Expert Masterclass with Tony Robinson, who is going to talk to us about some tips and tricks for successful short-term rental investments. So before I hand it over back to Matthew, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, this masterclass is being recorded and will be available on our hospitable YouTube channel after the webinar, so you can watch it again. After, you can watch it again there. Uh, regarding questions, as Matthew said, if you have questions throughout the masterclass, please leave them in the Q and A section. At the end, we're going to have a dedicated Q and A session, so upvote those questions you like, and we'll get to those. And definitely, last but not least, uh, you can see hospitable social media handles, and there's going to be a ton of useful and insightful content tonight, uh, today even. Uh, so we encourage you during this masterclass to post on stories, tag us, share with friends and fellow hosts and spread the word. Uh, so without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Matthew. Ah, uh, thank you so very much, Daniel. And and as Daniel said, welcome all, and thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Matthew. I'm the VP customers here at Hospitable, and I always look forward to hosting these master classes. Tonight's no exception. So we're honored to have Tony Robinson, uh, the founding member of Alpha Greek Capital, a real estate investment company that focuses on acquiring and operating short-term rentals. Share his knowledge with you. In this masterclass, we're going to talk about short-term rental investments how to analyze them, how to drive some investment funding, establish those long-term partnerships, and much more. Um, but before we go in, we'll tell you just a bit more about Tony. So I love his story here. I just saw your LinkedIn post from a year ago, and it got me all jazzed up. But at the start of 2021, um, after four years as a supply chain manager over at Tesla, Tony entered the world of entrepreneurship. So today, he's pretty well known in the world of real estate investing and definitely well known in the world of short-term rentals. And so after starting his investment career by purchasing single family homes as long-term rentals, he found the tremendous opportunity that short-term rentals provide and the rest is history. And since he's focused 100% of his efforts on growing that area of his business specifically, and so as a result, he and Alpha Greek, Alpha Geek, sorry, Alpha Geek Capital has managed to build an incredible 10 million dollar short-term rental portfolio in just two years. And, and aside from that, Tony, I hear you're also a, a devoted husband and father. What, how, how many kids you got over there? Uh, just one, just one. He's uh, 14. So he's uh, at that age where you love him, but they drive you crazy. But just one. I got six and three. So we got a long way to go from there. But, you know, <laughs> thanks so much for being here. So just to get started, you said you went to a Laker game. So I'm assuming we're located out in L.A., right? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, well first, brother, I, I appreciate you guys having me on, man. Um, I'm a, a huge fan of Hospitable as a software um, so to be able to give back to the community means a lot to me, man. So I'm excited to be here with you guys. But yeah, I, uh, I'm uh, located in Southern California. I've been here my entire life. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a, a husband, father, business owner. Um, some of you guys may know me from the Real Estate Rookie podcast. We're like the second largest real estate podcast that exists, I think. Um, and I co-host that with my, my good friend, Ashley Care. And then my wife and I also run the Real Estate Robinson's YouTube channel where we talk all things real estate with a heavy dose of, of Airbnbs, man. So excited to share my story and give some value. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And we'll just jump right on into it, right? So as I mentioned, we were focused on long-term rentals. And then what was that catalyst? Obviously, the, the bottom line's attractive, but what was it that really you know launched you into the world of short-term rentals from your, your long-term ventures? Sure. Yeah. So I was uh, like most people, and I'm, I'm going to start a little bit back and I'll, I'll kind of tie in into what you ask here, Matthew. But uh, like most people, I, you know, climbed the corporate ladder, got a, a really decent paying job, uh, but knew that that I wanted more uh, out of life. I, I didn't want to uh, kind of be that that corporate slave for the next 30 to, to 40 years of my life. So I, I decided, you know, real estate is the path that I want to go down. And, you know, when I when I looked at the traditional kind of long term rental single family route and I saw, OK, cool, if I'm making like two to three hundred dollars a month in cash flow and I've got, you know, this relatively, you know, six figure salary I got to replace, like I'm, I'm going to need a lot of these little houses to try and make that happen. So I did research and tried to figure out what is the fastest way from a real estate investing perspective for me to be able to, to quit my job with cash flow. And uh, I landed on this book called The Best Ever Apartment Syndication Book by this guy named Joe Fairless. 
And Joe's built, you know, a massive portfolio now with a company called Ashcroft, Ashcroft Capital. But um, one of the pieces of advice that he gave was like, if you really want to scale big and scale fast, you should do apartment syndication. And uh, so I said, okay, cool. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to go out and buy apartment complexes. Um, but in order to be a successful syndicator, right, to raise money from other investors, you need to have some kind of track record. And at that time, I had zero real estate uh, investments of any kind. So in Joe's book, he said he bought a few long-term rental single-family residences first, used that as his track record, and then started soliciting funds for other investors to buy his first apartment complex. So I said, okay, cool. If Joe did it, I'm going to do it. Uh, I bought four long-term rental single-family houses out of state there in Louisiana. And after those four, I said, okay, cool, I'm ready. Now's the time. Got my track record. Let's go do it. Now, as I finished off those long-term rentals, um, this was the early part of 2020, um, right when COVID started to come on. So I was, uh, there, there were a lot of challenges facing me at that time, right? I was this first time apartment syndicator um, with no experience. There's this massive global pandemic that has all the investors kind of shaken. Uh, people who were selling properties are, are pulling them off the market because they don't know what's going to happen. So th there's all these things that happen. So it became incredibly difficult for me to get that first apartment deal. So I'm sitting on some capital. A buddy of mine says, hey, Tony, I, I know you were thinking about buying apartment complexes, but I just bought this cabin in uh, what's called the Smoky Mountains area of Tennessee. Oh, yeah. And he said, I don't, I don't know if you've ever thought about buying a short-term rental, but here are the numbers. And he showed me what this cabin was supposed to do. And I was like, holy crap. Like that one cabin is going to do almost as much revenue as some of these smaller apartments that we were looking at. And I can do that with just one property. So we ended up buying, uh, as soon as he got his under contract, three weeks later, we had ours under contract. Wow. And I'd never heard of that part of Tennessee before, never been there. Um, but we looked at the data, the data supported that decision. Uh, so we bought that first cabin and it did phenomenally well for us. And we've been all in on short-term rentals ever since. That's amazing. That's amazing. So let's let's dive into that a little bit. You said that the data, right? So you took a look at the data and it said, hey, let's let's jump in. What were some of those things that you were looking at? What were some of those things important to you uh, in order to make that investment and make that leap? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, brother. And before I answer that, I just want to say like what I'm going to share is what's important for me. Mm. Every investor will have a different uh, type of investing criteria. Uh, some people invest strictly for uh, tax purposes. Like they just want as much tax benefit as they can possibly get, right? Because wow. they have lots of active income from other businesses. Some people, uh, what they focus on is appreciation because maybe they're investing not for cash flow today, but for the ability to uh, retire off of their investments 10, 15, 30 years down the road. Um, and then other people focus on cash flow. And then some people kind of focus on a mix of all of those things. So I think the first thing that I, I would want people here to kind of take into account is that you need to identify what's important to you. Like what, what are the drivers for your investment philosophy? Is it cash flow? Is it appreciation? Is it tax benefits? Is it something else? Do you want to buy short-term rentals in a place you actually want to go visit? Mm -hmm. uh, so everyone has their, their own criteria. For us at the time, the one thing we were focused on was cash flow and cash on cash return. So how much profit can we generate and what kind of return can we get on our investment? So as we started to look at some of the, the data in the Smoky Mountains market, we came to realize that at the time, the market prices, like the average median price of properties was so incredibly low in comparison to the revenue that those properties would generate. And last year, that first cabin that we bought gave us a 138% cash on cash return. Wow. So we invested... $84,000, or I'm sorry, we invested 65, so about 60,000 bucks to, to acquire that property. And last year in profits, we did $84,000, wow. right? So for us, what we were most focused on was price point, revenue, cash on cash return. Okay. And, and with that, right, what, what some of the, uh, are you using some of those tools that are out there to kind of figure out what the return is in the area? We're using anything in specific that our audience would be familiar with in our yeah, space. Yeah. So there, there, there's a few ways to do this. And that's a, that's a great question, right? Um, we used a pay tool. So we use Price Labs. Price Labs is both our dynamic pricing tool and we use it for market research. And as we kind of looked at the data that Price Labs had on the market of uh, the Smoky Mountains at the time, and we started to analyze different deals, we, we came to found that there was a, a, a kind of sweet spot where we were able to maximize revenue in terms of bed count. So when we looked at one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms, um, and then we compared that to four and five bedrooms, 
we noticed that the price difference between a, a three bedroom and a four or five bedroom was relatively small, but the revenue was much bigger, oh, right? Yeah. So you know, it was, it was a smaller, it was a very small increase in cash outlay to purchase a four bedroom, but it was a disproportionately large increase in revenue. And then we looked, okay, if four and five bedrooms are better than threes, what if we go up to a six? And we almost, we found the inverse to be true. And we went up to a six bedroom, the price difference when you go from a five to a six was disproportionately large, but the revenue difference was disproportionately small. So that four and that five bedroom kind of became the sweet spot for us in that market. And that's the the size of property that we pursued. Wow. And we bought one, five, one, four in a relatively short period of time after that. Wow, that's amazing. And I'm just going to take a quick pause here just to let the folks know once again. So down at the bottom of that Zoom window, there's the Q&A button. So feel free to start firing off those questions so that the rest of the folks can go ahead and upvote as well to the ones that are most important to them. We're going to talk here for about 20, 30 minutes, and we'll be sure to answer your questions at the end. So let's fill up that Q&A because Tony's got some great knowledge to here to, to share with us. So so you gave us some context there about you know analyzing those investments, right? taking a look at bed count, taking a look at some of the local data. Is there anything else important that, that you... Anything else that you want to touch upon, especially for some of these folks just getting started or starting to take a look at it? What are some of those other points that you're analyzing for those short-term rental investments? Yeah, so that that what we just talked about would be the first point, and I call that profitability, right? Like if I compare, um, you know, if I analyze several properties, like what kind of profitability am I able to achieve? Uh, the other things I look at are policies and popularity. Mm. I'll talk about policies first. I always want to make sure that whenever I step into a new market, that I have a good understanding of what uh, the policies of uh, that market is as it relates to short-term rental. So is it fully banned to uh, operate a short-term rental? Is it free reign where there is no law or ordinances around short-term rentals? Or is there a somewhat strict or relaxed? Like, What are the steps I need to take to legally operate a short-term rental in that market? And I think there's a there's a misconception with people that you always just want to go for the markets that have no regulation. And I don't agree with that. Mm. Um, I think there is a certain element of risk when you invest in a market that has no regulations whatsoever, because oftentimes it's not a matter of if they're going to develop reg uh, regulations, it's a matter of when. And if you purchase in the city that had, you know, it was like the wild, wild west, then a year down the road after you buy, a city council decides to finally regulate all these rampant Airbnb owners, you could be in a position like the folks of Atlanta, where Atlanta shut down like 4,000 short-term rentals, mm -hmm. or there was uh, gosh, Syracuse in New York. Syracuse just, they almost had no regulations. They finally passed regulations. And you went from being able to list out your property 365 days a year, and they dramatically decreased. It's like 21 days out of the year wow. to be able to operate that property, right? So I like to go into markets that have already kind of figured out how they're going to deal with short-term rentals. And I almost prefer to invest in markets where the barrier to entry is a little bit higher because it means that the amount of competition is decreased as well. So for example, we just bought in a city that has a hard cap on the number of short-term rentals that they're going to issue at any given uh -huh. point in time. But since we were one of the folks that got in under that hard cap, now what happens? There's a, there's a fixed limit on the supply of short-term rentals but as the popularity of that market continues to increase, that supply is going to hold steady. So the folks that got in beforehand will, will tend to do well. So that's the first thing I look for is the, uh, the policies. The second thing I look for is popularity. I typically want to invest in a market that has already somewhat proven itself to be able to support a profitable Airbnb or short-term rental, okay? Um, if a market has 40 listings, I might not move into that market. Right, because I don't know if there's enough demand there for my property to be profitable. I typically want to see at least like two to three hundred listings in a market for me to even consider analyzing properties in there. Because as much as I love, you know, I think that I'm a super creative person and we've got cool design and all these things, like if the market can't support it, the market can't support it. So I want to see a little bit of infrastructure, a little bit of um, you know, popularity in that market before I move into it. So those, those are really the three things I look for. I want to understand the policies. I want to understand the popularity. And then I want to understand the, the profitability. That's amazing. That's incredible. And, you know, I, I think what you said and what you spoke of, of really understanding what you're trying to accomplish, right? What are your goals in investing, getting started? I mean, we hear that all the time with so many different pieces of the short-term rental industry, right? Have a good idea of what you're looking to accomplish. And typically, 
when folks have trouble is when they stray from that, right? When they have like, hey, I want to go ABC and then all of a sudden D starts to look a bit enticing. And maybe that location where regulation is a bit wild, wild west-ish and, and that just kind of looks too good to be true. And then that's the one that keeps you up at night because you're going through and hey, that's not really that's not really part of my path. That's not really what I'm focusing on. I'm putting all my energy into this focus. So we know that is going to take us somewhere else. Um, so f wonderful. <clears throat> The idea that you're looking for places that are regulated, like absolutely, because I've seen all ends of the spectrum, even people who are like, hey, I'm trying to find those illegal places and sneak in right. there. I couldn't sleep at night. That's for darn sure. Um, exactly. So partnerships, right? So let's talk about some of the partnerships that you've created, you know, in your time here. Um, tell me more about some of those essential partners and how you've established, you know, long term partnerships, whether it's investments or even just, you know, providers that you're working with. Yeah, that's a that's another great question. I, I think that the sooner that investors can realize that real estate is really about relationships, the the sooner they'll find success. Um, I could not run my business today without the people that are involved in making this whole thing work. And there there are people and partnerships on both sides. Before we purchase a property, we have private money lenders who lend us money to complete our rehabs. We have uh, capital partners who lend us money to, or not lend us money, but partner with us to purchase properties, right? Where they bring the capital. After we close, we have partnerships with our cleaning, with our cleaners, with our handymen, with local vendors. Uh, I try and make nice with the people at City Hall. <laughs> so if I have a question, I can, I know who to go to so I can, I can get those questions answered. Love so the, the partnerships are a very integral part of, of what we do. But I think what, what most people kind of get excited about is um, the, the partnerships on that front end, right? So how can I identify partnerships or create partnerships that allow me to purchase properties without yes. necessarily using all of my own capital? So I'll give you guys kind of the, the, the framework here of, of what we've done. So there, there are countless people out there who have the understanding um, or want to invest in real estate, but they do not have the time, desire, or ability to do it themselves, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it's a, a busy working professional who listens to real estate podcasts and loves the idea, but they're too busy with their day job to, to really find a deal, source it, and do all those other things, right? Um, maybe it's a, the, 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 the doctor who works 80 hours a week and knows that, that he or she should be putting money away into something else, but they're just too busy to even think about it. There are countless people out there that, that kind of fit that mold. Your job, uh, if you want to leverage those kind of partnerships, is to find a way to position yourself as a person that can solve that problem for them. So we've done countless partnerships where we find the deal, we manage the rehab, we set the property up, fully furnish it, and then we manage it long term, we create the listings, set up the pricing, do all those things. And all our partners have to do is write a check. And then they're done. Right. And it's a great return for them. It's a great business model for us. But how do you find those partnerships? Right. The very first thing I think all of you guys should be doing is documenting your journey. So everyone that's on this call right now, there's 169 participants. Um, all of you should be you know, open up your phone, take a picture, post it to your Instagram story, say on this call, learning lots of great things about short-term rentals, right? When you analyze your next deal, open your phone, take a picture, record a video, say, Hey guys, I just recorded this, this deal, or I just analyzed this deal. Um, this market that I've been thinking about investing in returns look okay. I'll keep you guys posted on how it goes. Right. And you start kind of planting these seeds and eventually someone in your audience who you never would have thought of is going to reach out to you and say, you know what, Tony, I've actually been thinking about investing in real estate. It's so funny that you posted that video. It happened to me. It's happened to investors that I know. And you don't need a massive following to do this, right? Like we're able to do it at scale because we have, you know, almost 60,000 followers on Instagram, this YouTube channel with tens of thousands of followers. But I have a friend who has a private Instagram, not even open to the public. It's a private Instagram profile with like 600 followers. Mm -hmm. And he was able to partner on five short-term rentals in one year, all through people that found him on Instagram. Wow. Right. Wow. Like people that were already in his network that he didn't even know were interested in investing in real estate. And as he started to post about what he was doing and give value to the people that were following him, they reached out to him and said, man, I would love to work with you on something. So you don't need this massive following. What you need is consistency. What you need to, what you need is like to be vocal and to provide value to people. And eventually they'll raise their hand and, and, and kind of say, Hey, we would love to work together.
That's incredible. And, um, you know, we had a discussion here in the past as well about just even filling your rentals and just putting it on social media. Do, do your friends and family know that you operate short term rentals? A vast yeah. majority probably don't. And just throwing it out there to your audience, you may get a couple bookings out there just from that, just from letting people know, hey, this is what I'm doing. So very interesting that you can make a few investments or get, you know, get a get a few investments properly funded, um, you know, by reaching out to your audience as well. Don't be shy. Don't be shy at the end of it all. Right. Um, so you mentioned before, like you're looking for places where 100, 200. I mean, where is that on the scale? Could you give us some insights on, on investing in places with like heavy tourism? Are you only focused on those places or, you know, is kind of 200 there a bit in the middle for you? Tell me a bit more about that. It's, it's an ever evolving strategy for us, right? I think for us, we're always trying to look at, you know, where, where can we get the best return? In 2021 and 2020, 2019 years before, I think you could go into some of these bigger markets, uh, some of these more mature markets, throw a dart at a board, find a property and, and make a great return. I, I think slowly those days are, are, are starting to become over, right? And you need to be a little bit more intentional around where you're buying. So we've we've kind of slowed down acquisitions in some of these bigger, well-known uh, vacation destinations for the reason that they are bigger and well-known. So those markets have been flooded with new buyers. And as supply is kind of holds steady from like properties to purchase and demand goes way up, that means prices go up as well. Mm -hmm. So we've seen appreciation in these markets from a purchase price perspective, but we haven't seen that same appreciation in ADRs yet. Right. So what was a 138% return on a cabin two years ago, three years ago is now a 15% return. Right. So as these kind of shifts in the markets have, have happened, both with interest rates going up and uh, competition increasing, we are starting to look more now for secondary and tertiary markets where there's a little less um, demand, right, from a buyer's perspective. So we're trying to find what are some pockets and maybe some cities and states I don't personally know of, but, but that are popular in that part of the country that we can go tackle. So we, uh, we kind of went on like a, a, a tour of the United States this past summer. Um, both offering, uh, submitting offers on different properties in different states and, and touring some of those properties as well. So I think that'll be a big part of our strategy moving forward is some of those smaller markets that have a little bit more upside still. And, and you know, the other question I was going to ask is investing out of state. I mean, you seem that it's no big thing, right? You were starting off with Louisiana and you went right to Tennessee all the way out there from California. Um, yeah. How about outside the country? Have you given any consideration that? You know, we we have. Um, we, we definitely have, but as you know, not a whole lot, but what I've, from the little research I've done, it is difficult at times to get financing overseas. Um, and even to own the land, like I, I can't remember which country it was I was looking at, but it's like, you can even own the land as a foreigner. You had to do like a, a 99 year lease or something like that. So there, wow. there's just some, some nuances that we saw that have, have kind of turned us off from it, but eventually I would love to own something overseas, um, more so for like personal reasons. It'd be great to have a place in Costa Rica. I love Costa Rica. Um, but we, we haven't, we haven't gone down that path just yet. No worries. Well, when you're ready, you can come talk to me over here in Portugal. We, yeah, I, you get a Portuguese citizen here and a dual <laughs> citizen. So we'll make sure, we'll make sure we make some things happen there for you, Tony. Um, okay. yeah. And so recently, any big changes to your strategies? Obviously, right? We're we're on a bit of shaky ground here. We don't know what's coming. Some people are getting nervous. Other people see opportunity. Um, sure. You know, in, in the past six months or so, like have have you made any changes to your strategy when it comes to you know short term rentals and investment funding? Any of that? Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question and super timely. And I, I want to answer before I do. I just want to I want to share a story that someone shared with me recently. Um, and I wish I could remember who told me this, but it was a friend of mine. Sorry for not giving you credit, buddy. But um, <laughs> he told me about uh, an interview that Jeff Bezos did. So Jeff Bezos, billionaire owner of Amazon, and uh, Jeff was being interviewed and someone asked him, they said, Jeff, what do you think it was that made Amazon so successful? And the interviewer said, it, it must have been your your logistics, right? You know, Amazon, two-day shipping, everything. Show, like I can order something on Amazon today and it could show up tonight, right? Mm -hmm. And Jeff said, no, it, it wasn't our logistics. And said, well, Jeff, it, it must be your your engineering, right? Your, your engineers, you guys built this massive platform, all these services. And he's like, no, it, it wasn't engineering. Well, well, Jeff, then it had to be marketing, right? Like you guys just did a great job of marketing Amazon as a company. He's like, no, it wasn't marketing either. And if you're, you know, exhausted at this point, says, well, Jeff, what was it? And Jeff says, what made Amazon successful is that we had patient capital. 
Oh, okay. He said, when you think of our competitors, if they invested a thousand dollars into a new initiative, they would want to see their return in 12 months, 24 months, maybe 36 months with Amazon. If I invested a thousand dollars today, I don't need to see my return for another 10 years. And when he, when he framed it that way, I said, man, what a tremendous way to think about building an actual business, right? Like it's not always just chasing the immediate dollar, but how do we plant seeds that 10, 10 years from now will allow us to experience this, this massive amount of wealth? So I, I always kind of keep that story in the back of my mind. And to answer your question, um, we, we have made some shifts in our investing strategy, but here, here's the thing I, I would present to people first. If you're able to buy a property today with a 7% interest rate, and it cash flows, why wouldn't you buy that property, mm -hmm. right? Who cares if the interest rates are high? Who cares if prices have doubled in the last couple of years? If the deal makes sense today and you're able to hit your own return metrics, why wouldn't you buy that property? And let's, let's look at both scenarios, right? Say you buy today at 7% interest rate and interest rates go up to 10% next year. You will be so incredibly happy that you bought at <laughs> seven, right? And say on the flip side, you buy at 7%, and interest rates go down to four, well, now you can refinance and it's an even better deal. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. So there, there's always a, a tremendous amount of opportunity. If the deal makes sense, we want to make sure that we buy it. Now, how have we shifted our investing strategy? It's really what I mentioned earlier, right? Where as our traditional markets that we've looked at have heated up and compressed returns, we're now looking where else can we deploy capital in some of these smaller, maybe lesser known markets where maybe the, the gross revenue isn't going to be six figures like it is in the Smoky Mountains. But if we can find a property that will give us sixty, eighty thousand dollars in gross revenue, but still get a 50% cash on cash return, that's a better deal for us. So we're looking in these markets where we can still find that kind of sweet spot like how we did in the Smoky Mountains when we first purchased there. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so the before we jump to our, our audience questions here, because we got a bunch. Thank you so much, everybody, for filling up that q and I just ask and you shall receive. Uh, and don't forget, you can upvote with that thumbs up. So the ones that you really want to hear, go ahead and hit that thumbs up there. Tony, before we jump into it, biggest mistakes, right? What are some of those big mistakes that you've made that you want to caution or maybe not caution because, you know, we know how much mistakes teach us. But were there any big kind of fails or mistakes along your path that that really stand out to you? So I'm, I'm going to give you an answer, but it won't be specific to a short-term rental, right? Um, my mistake is more about building a, uh, building a business. Mm. And our goal, our, still our goal is to build a, a big portfolio. Like we want to be at a billion dollars in assets under management over the next decade. And that's always been our goal, right? We want to build something big. We want it to, to move fast. And with that goal in mind, we waited too long to start hiring people to help us achieve that goal. Uh -huh. So for a long time, it was me, my wife, who's who's also my business business partner, and uh, her cousin, who's our third partner, and it was just three of us, and we were running around like chickens with our heads cut off, and a lot of these systems and processes that allow for scale, we were not putting in place because we were too busy trying to put out fires every day, and I think had we invested earlier on in hiring some of the folks that we've hired we would have scaled even faster because they would have been doing a lot of that day-to-day -day work, whereas we could have been focused on growing the business. So if your goal is to build an actual business and not just be a real estate investor, then you need to do things like hire people, right? If you want to be a solopreneur, that's fine. But if you want to build a big business, it, it's only possible if you find the right people to add to your team. So that was a, that was a big mistake that, that we made was waiting too long. And then it's like a, a part B to that. It was not documenting our processes when we had one property. We waited until mm. we had like 12. And at that point, there's so many things happening. It's hard to even kind of keep track and, and keep your head on straight. But if you, when you have one property, can get really clear about, okay, if a guest asks for early checkout uh, or a late checkout or early check-in, how do we handle that? If a guest forgets something at the property, which all guests do, how do we handle that? And if you start documenting all of those things, so it's a super clear standard operating procedure, as you start to plug these different people into your business, mm. there it's not tribal knowledge. It's a yeah. very clear process. They can pull it up, look at it, know how to respond, and it allows you to move even faster. So those those were two of the big mistakes that, that we made as we built our business. 
that's incredible. I, I know at Hospitable, that was one of the early challenges that we had is we were notoriously late to hire people. Recently, we've changed that. And we just absolutely blew up in the past a couple months here. And it's been great just being able to bring all of these talented individuals to our company and really allow them and give them the tools such as you know documentation and, and standard procedures to right. just go with it and absolutely flourish and thrive. I'm super excited for what we have upcoming here with Hospitable because we got a full team and, and we're coming. So so watch out. Um. Great. All right. So, Tony, let's jump into some of these questions. Thank you all so much for sharing those questions once again. Uh, RevPan versus ADR. Which figure should I focus on and why? Which one should I focus on for analyzing meeting my revenue goals? Do you have any advice to that one? Yeah. Um, so, we, yeah. So, when, when we analyze our deals, we look at both occupancy and ADR, which is, is exactly RevPan, right? Um, I think just looking at either one of those numbers individually is risky, right? Like, if you just look at ADR, I could, sure, I could, maybe I could get super high ADRs, but if my occupancy is 20%, I'm probably, it's probably not going to work out. So I think whenever you analyze a deal, you definitely want to go like the ref par route where you're looking at both occupancy and ADR and using that to understand what your total revenue will be. Wonderful. Um, and when investing into different properties, Walter here asked us, are you using a single LLC or are you creating a separate LLC for each property? That one was pretty popular that people were interested in, especially as we talk about different states and things along those lines. Anything in your business structure specific to that? So first I'll say I am, a, I am not a CPA. I am not an attorney. And uh, I think that decision uh, is, is definitely a, a personal one. Um, if you are super... Uh, sensitive to risk, then, you know, maybe putting a, each property in its own LLC is the right route for you, right? If you're, if you're a lawyer, and the idea of litigation keeps you up at night, then yeah, maybe going that route makes makes the most sense. Um, if you're not super worried about that, then you can dump a bunch of properties into into one LLC and, and do it that way. Um, we have multiple partnerships with different investors. So for us, um, we do have kind of like different entities set up for each one. Um, but if we have one partnership with multiple properties, and typically those multiple properties still fall under that one entity. So our entities are based more so on the partnership and not the individual property. That makes perfect sense. Um, so Tyson here, and a few people are curious, which tool within Price Labs, by the way, we love the Price Labs folks, fantastic tool, great integration with Hospitable as well, shameless sure. plug. Um, which tool within Price Labs do you use to do that market research? Is there a specific feature within there that uh, that you can point to the folks? Yeah, so Price Labs offers a, dyna a dynamic pricing uh, product but last year they also rolled out a market dashboard product, which is uh, essentially like a competitor to AirDNA. And um, I, I really enjoyed the market dashboard because there's such an incredible amount of data, both just like aggregate market data where you can see like 90th percentile pricing, 75th percentile pricing, 50th percentile pricing, but you also have the ability to build your own custom comp sets inside of uh, uh, the Price Labs market dashboards to see how they're pricing on a daily basis. So there, there's a lot that you can do, but yeah, to answer the question, the Price Labs markets dashboards is what I use. Okay. Um, and then there's some other great tools out there, like you manage, you know, AirDNA has got a tool. I know Transparent's got a nice tool out there um, that you could take a look at. So definitely do your research, see what see what those tools provide. And just like any software, just like any of these tools, I mean, I say it all the time with Hospitable, you know, I mentioned it to Tony earlier. What do you need? Have an idea of those things that you're looking for and then go seek that software provider. Because we all offer so many different things. We all have so many different wonderful tools. But I tell people all the time when they come to me with, hey, I need ABC, that's fantastic. We can give you A, we can give you B. C is not it. If C is an absolute have to have, there's going to be another provider for you. If you can get away without C, then you know you definitely want to consider us. But having a good idea of what those pieces are that you're looking for, what are those have-to-haves, what are those nice-to-haves, it's going to make it that much easier when you're searching for software because there's a lot of us out there. Um, so make sure that the tools that you're looking for and that you need to run your business are available. Don't let that salesman sell you otherwise. Um, yeah. I won't, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> all right, so managing, so Chrissy here and, and a bunch of folks here asked, thanks, Chrissy. Advice on managing a property during an economic downturn, recession, knowing that STRs have never been through a recession before. I mean, technically, like short-term rentals, vacation rentals have been through quite a quite a few recessions, right? They've been right. around for, for quite some time. But I guess in this Airbnb world, right, we haven't really hit a recession. Anything in particular when it comes to managing your property specifically that you're making adjustments for, you know, in the face of a potential recession here? 
Yeah. So f- first thing I'll say is, is kind of tying back to my Jeff Bezos comment about patient capital. Um, every recession in the United States going back to like the, the mid 1900s lasted on average between six months and 16 months. Right. So somewhere around a year and a half is what most mm-hmm. recessions last, some shorter, some longer. So what you need to ask yourself is, can this property sustain itself for the next six to 18 months? Mm-hmm. And most of our short-term rentals, if you bought at a, you know, you made a smart decision when you bought, will probably be able to cover their expenses themselves. So like worst case scenario, you have 12 to 18 months where this property maybe isn't as profitable as you thought it would be. Once you get past that phase, we should see the economy kind of get back, uh, you know, grow its legs and kind of start breathing its life how, how it was before. So that's my first point is, is to not panic, right? Just because we're in a recession, that doesn't mean that you were, you made the worst decision of your life. There, there <laughs> will be a light at the end of the tunnel. Things will return back to normal. And if history repeats itself, after every recession, the economy always rebounds and gets to a point that was bigger and better than before the recession. So that's that's my, my first piece of advice. Um, now, in terms of how we are kind of adapting uh, with, with where we are in the economy, there's a few things we're doing. Um, first, we're trying to reinvest back into our existing properties, okay? Like, are there different things that we can add, upgrade um, to make our properties more competitive, okay? Like, we were just in Tennessee uh, maybe two months ago, and we're completely renovating the downstairs level of one of our cabins to create a better game room and a movie room, right? Um, and that's because we know that certain amenities in those markets are what help drive ADR. So right now, if you have the decision between maybe taking whatever, $20,000 and using that to either buy another property or investing in your existing property, it might be worthwhile to kind of play out those two scenarios. Like where can you get the better return? Is it buying this other property or is it maybe just reinvesting into the properties that I already have to make them more competitive? So that, that's one thing that you can do. Um, the, the last thing that we try and compete on is, is price, right? I think that's a, a slippery slope. Hmm. When you're when you're looking at a property, and especially if you're buying a new property, it's even easier. Um, but location, design, and amenities are the things we try and focus on. Location, design, and amenities are things we try and focus on. So if you can pull any of those levers when you're either purchasing a new property or, or upgrading your existing one, those are the things that I would focus on. So what amenities in your market are driving people to book those other properties. And you can pull that information from Price Labs and the market dashboard to see which properties are the best performing uh, best performing properties in your market and use that as your market research. And if every other listing has a Tesla uh, charger and a uh, hot tub and a pool table, then maybe you should explore adding a Tesla charger, a pool tub and a hot table, uh, and a hot tub and a pool table, right? So it's going to vary from market to market, but framework wise, those are the kind of things we're, that we're looking at in our business. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned, we, we keep talking about price labs and that tool. Had you tried some other tools? Somebody wants to know here, have you, have you thought about air DNA? And again, everybody has their own unique preference and there are right. unique needs there. Did you try any other of those market data tools? Was there anything that, that for you and serving your purpose didn't really work or, or, or you moved on from? So honestly, um, when we when we first started, we kind of dabbled between Price Labs and uh, and Air DNA, and I felt that um, Air DNA, or I'm sorry, Price Labs offered just a little bit more uh, detailed data than what I was seeing from Airbnb or from Air DNA. Um, but to to be honest, I haven't tried Air DNA in like last like 18 months, so mm-hmm. things could have changed. But when we were when, you know when we were kind of still trying to decide which pricing tool works best, um, it was it was Price Labs for us. And, and that's definitely something as well. Like I know there's obvious different markets have different strengths for the, some of these tools. So don't hesitate to reach out to people in your area, some other short-term hosts and ask, hey, what tools are you using? Which tools have added the most value for you? Uh, we're in hospitality after all. Everybody kind of wants to share as much information as they possibly can. So don't hesitate to go into those local markets that you're interested in and kind of trying to understand, hey, what are some of these hosts utilizing here? What are the tools that they can vouch for that have helped them here specifically in this area? Because if you're looking at pricing over in Portugal, or you're looking at pricing down in Louisiana, some of these companies are going to have different data sets. So try to tap into that local network that that is there already and see how they can help you and how they can help make you know informed decisions on which software and, and different tools you can use. Um, okay. Great. So you stayed in some, so Michael here asked, 
You stated that in some circumstances, you find the deal, you rehab, furnish, manage the property, right? End to end. I love that. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. What percentage would you take of the profit or how do you structure compensation on these types of deals as much as you can share with us? But that's something interesting. I just, you know, I talked to a few people here in Portugal that, hey, you buy a short-term rental, there's already revenue coming in. So as soon as you sign over that check and we signed the documentation, you're collecting rental revenue. And then when it's time to sell, I'll sell it for you and we'll move on to the next one. And the entire time we'll be managing it. That seems incredible. Um, so yeah, could you speak to any of that on how you're structuring some of those deals or what they look like? Yeah, I get this question all the time. And I'm, I, my, my answer is always the same. Whatever makes you and that other person happy, is what is a reasonable partnership agreement, okay? Um, there is no one size fits all. And the way that we structure our partnerships may not work for someone else. And the way that they structure their partnerships may not work for us. So I can tell you the things that we look at when we're talking about structuring partnerships. And I'm assuming this question is more so when you're not bringing capital and the other person is bringing capital into the deal, yep. right? So the first thing you can look at is, do you pay yourself a property management fee? right? Like, sh should you charge the property a 10%, 15%, 20%, whatever number you feel comfortable with, should you charge that property a management fee for your day to day work in the business, right? The second thing is, for the partner that put up the capital, how are they going to get repaid? Or, or do they even get repaid? Right? And we call that capital recapture. So for example, say that I put $100,000 into a deal, and that deal cash flows, whatever, 1500 bucks a month. I could say that as a partner that put up the capital, I'm going to take out seven fifty of that fifteen hundred dollars every month, which leaves seven fifty, and then we'll split that, right? I'll I'll get you know forty percent, you get sixty percent for doing all the day to day stuff, but there's some level of money that gets taken off of the profits every single month that comes back to me. The other option is on the capital recapture is that you could do it if you sell, okay? So maybe I put in a hundred grand, and when we go to sell the property, there's four hundred thousand dollars in profit. Before we split that $400,000, I get my $100,000 back. And then that $300,000, we split according to whatever our equity stake is. So that's something to consider when you're talking about like capital partners. So uh, property management fee, capital recapture, the actual equity split, that's going to depend on how much value you guys as a partnership give to the person that's doing all the work. What I will say is that oftentimes, especially for newer investors, they overvalue the the person that's bringing the capital and undervalue the person that's doing everything else. Mm -hmm. When you think about the, the time and energy that goes into finding a deal, getting it under contract, rehabbing that, managing that rehab, managing the property long-term, that is a tremendous amount of work. Months yeah. and months of time just to go from found property to ready to be listed, right? Months. And think about all the effort that, that person has to put in to make that deal happen. Now think about the person that, that funded the deal. What did they have to do? They had to wire some money. 10 minutes and, and their, their entire involvement is done. So I think oftentimes we overvalue how much, uh, we overvalue the person that's putting the money. We undervalue the person that's doing the work. So think about what you feel is, in, uh, is a fair amount of equity for you to get for all that, that work you're putting into the business. Okay. So those are some things to consider at yeah. the end of the day, it's whatever you and that other person feel is reasonable. Maybe it's 50, 50, maybe it's 75, 25 with the management fee. Maybe it's, you know, 64, like it, whatever you and that person feel comfortable with is what you guys should do. So I'm interested. This is a personal question. I'm going to ask you, do you feel that when you got started uh, as compared to now, were you, because I, I, I feel like I'd undervalue myself a little bit, right? I'd be like a bit nervous here. I'm, I'm, not really going on the bold side here, but it seems that, hey, if you believe in yourself, did you see your yourself being a bit less bold early on and a bit bolder now? I think you have to be, right? Because when you're first starting, if you don't have a track record, um, the maybe the partnership opportunities, it's kind of like slim pickings, right? Like you yeah, don't have yeah. very many to choose from. So you kind of have to take what you can get. But as you start to build that track record, and as you have confidence in your own ability to do what you say you're going to do, now you can kind of stand up for yourself in a way that says, hey, I know what my time, my energy, my value is worth. And if you don't agree with that, it's totally fine. It just means we're not meant to work together, right? Yeah. But I think when you're starting off by default, you maybe have to be a little bit, you know, a little bit more flexible, but it, it should adjust and change over time. Awesome. Um, so Kathy, hey, Kathy, thanks so much for reaching out. What software do you use to manage the income and expenses for your short term rentals? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So we we started off using Stessa. 
Um, and Cessna was cool because it was free, but it's definitely not built out for short-term rentals. Um, so now we use QuickBooks. Okay. And um, we have a, actually we have two bookkeepers now. Uh, one bookkeeper that's based overseas that just does like, let me attach this receipt to this transaction. Um, and then we have a, a bookkeeper that's based here in the States that does like all the, the kind of bigger, like, Hey, we just bought this property. What should this look like? And here's a chart of accounts we should be using. But the software we use is QuickBooks, but we did hire out a bookkeeping team to kind of handle the, the day-to-day -day management of that for us. Awesome. And, and the makeup of your team, like, are you, uh, you know, you obviously probably have a few people in these local markets, right? But when it comes to the actual operations, like, are you outsourcing to a lot of VAs? You bringing a lot of that work, you know, to, to here in the States, like, what's that look like for you? So on the operational side, we have three virtual assistants that handle all of the frontline guest communication. And then we have one uh, US-based operations manager that handles or that manages the VAs. And if there's any issue that the VAs are not able to address on their own, they escalate up to the operations manager. If she's not able to handle that, then she'll escalate up to us. Okay. A great little structure there. Yeah, absolutely. Um so I think you, you you flirted with Costa Rica there, but but Amy here wants to know any emerging markets that you're looking into or that you know that you're willing to share and give us a bit of yeah. the the recipe. I we're really big on on North Carolina right now. Um, there's a, a couple of spots in North Carolina that we think are are pretty pretty solid. Um, there is a Arkansas, which is seeing a, a lot of development as well. So we we like the idea of of, of Arkansas. Um, Florida, I think, will always do well anytime you're you're near the coast. Um, it's always, you know, uh, a competitive market. So there's a few little pockets that we're looking at, but here's the thing. I can drop a pin on a map in pretty much any of the States in America and find an opportunity to buy a good short-term rental. I think oftentimes we, we overanalyze, uh, where we should be investing when really, as long as you're able to legally operate that property. And you can achieve the return that you want to achieve, invest there, right? If someone told me that the middle of Iowa was the best place to buy a short-term rental because the data supported that, I go do that, right? <laughs> so it, 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 it really is, don't overanalyze. Pick a state, pick a city, get to work. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I, I just don't want people to spend too much time trying to find that perfect, you know, silver bullet of a market when really there are so many markets across the United States and across the world um, that will allow you to find a profitable deal. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. So many of us just overanalyze and right or waiting for that perfect opportunity. Sometimes it's just got to take that leap. Right. Um, right. So Alex here is looking for a bit of advice. Alex says with a solid income, would you consider a DSCR loan or a second home vacation home mortgage um, for your second Airbnb property? Looks like Alex is looking to grow in scale. I love it. Yeah. So honestly, it's going to depend, right? There are benefits to, to both of those types of debt. With a DSCR option, um, the benefit is, is that your DTI doesn't play a role. So if you, wouldn't, if you can't qualify for a traditional mortgage, then the, the DSCR is a great option to go with. The downside to the DSCR is it is a, typically a higher down payment and a higher interest rate, right? So the, the cost of the capital is significantly higher, sometimes double um, or more of what you would pay with a 10% down second home loan. So wow. if, if loan approval is a challenge, but capital is not, then a DSCR loan might be a good option. The 10% down second home loan is a great product, but first you have to make sure that you use the property personally for at least 14 days out of the year with most lenders. Um, so there, there is a, an element of you using it for yourself that you have to take into account as well. Um, you can't title your property under your business, right? So it, it's titled in your personal name. So if you're super averse to risk of doing that, then maybe that, that, that option isn't for you. And then the third thing is that you have to have the income and the debt to income ratio to qualify for all of your existing debts, mortgage, car payments, student loans, credit cards, whatever, plus the debt associated with this new property. So typically your income has to be pretty strong to be able to have both a primary residence and get approved for a second home loan. So if debt approval issues uh, are what maybe your maybe blockers for you, then the DSCR route makes more sense. But if you have the capital and you have the loan approval amount, I would typically push people to at least get that as many properties as they can with that 10% down second home loan, because it opens up your ability to maximize your returns. Because you talk about going from a 30, 25, 20% down payment to a 10% down payment, 
and you're cutting your 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 cash investment in half. Wow, that's a great breakdown. Thanks so much for for sharing that. Uh, are you R Ramon has a couple here. Thanks, Ramon. Are you shifting anything towards like midterm rentals, or are you doing strictly short term uh, in any of your markets? Right now, we're we're doing actually. Uh, so we have one property that we're, we're marketing currently as a midterm rental, but that's only because uh, we ran into some issues getting our permit approved. So there's some delays mm. there. So we're just trying to midterm rent it until that short term rental permit comes in. Um, but right now, all of our portfolio is uh, strictly short term. We do like the idea of experimenting with more of the midterm stays. However, all of our properties are in uh, true vacation destinations where uh -huh. the midterm market just isn't as big, right? You typically tend to see the the midterm rentals in uh, the more urban settings or suburban settings where there's colleges, universities, um, hospitals, um, maybe business headquarters, but we don't own any of those markets. But when we do eventually move into those markets, we would love to explore the, uh, the midterm rental stays as well. Interesting. Um, all right. So Ramon has another one here and I like this one. So Tony, Rob likes Chipotle. David yeah. Green likes donuts. What's your edible yeah. vice? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm also pretty big on Chipotle. Uh, Chick-fil-A is up there for me, but like my, my food, my go-to like cheat meal is, uh, uh, Pizza Hut pizza and a <laughs> cold stone ice cream. Like that, that combination is deadly for me. <laughs> Man, I was just so we we're just back in the States. Uh, we we're over in Vegas at the VRMA and I spent some time in Massachusetts. Yeah. And oh, my God, the food options are just absolutely unlimited out there. It absolutely drives me crazy. <laughs> I got a Mer I got a McDonald's in my town. That's yeah, all I got. That's, that's, that's all got. <laughs> And is Chipotle a vice? Like, I feel like Chipotle is, I mean. I mean, I've, I've probably spent way more money at Chipotle than I should have, for sure. Gosh, what I would give for some tacos right now or some burritos. Yeah. Um, all right, so then he did have a, a second part of that question. So I've got a cabin in a little-known lake in Kentucky that does well, but the infrastructure is weak. Yeah. How are you assessing smaller, lesser-known areas and the services they provide for the business? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So that that's part of the reason why popularity is one of the things that I look at. If I look at a market and I only see 40 listings, I can assume um, that I might have a difficult time finding a cleaner, finding yeah. a handyman. If I look at a market and I see that there's 300 listings, it probably means there's a few people out there who are making a living doing nothing but cleaning short-term rentals. So that's a big part of the reason why I am hesitant to go into markets that are too small. Um, but here, here's what I would do. Like, like say that I say that, you know, say that you look at this market, this, this, this Lake town, um, before I purchase, I would try and line up at least two really good cleaners. I would try and find a, like ask my realtor, like, Hey, Mr. Or Mrs. Realtor, can you make some recommendations? Mm -hmm. I would ask other investors in that market. Hey, are you willing to share your cleaners information? I would find any local Facebook groups, uh, and search for the word cleaner or maid or housekeeper or whatever it is. Um, and if you really want to get like, a you know, super, I don't know, like in the weeds with it, um, <laughs> go to that market, drive around between the hours of 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. when all the turns are happening and look for people that look like they're they're clean in short term rentals. Right. Wow. Um, we, we've you know, if I see a cleaner in, in the market that we're in, I'll hop out and I'll ask for a phone number. Right. And that's an easy way to to kind of build that relationship. So there's a few things you can do. But honestly, that 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 number of listings is always a good indicator of how difficult or easy it might be for you to find a cleaner. So that's definitely part of your your research there is trying to yeah. figure out, okay, how am I going to be able to to go ahead and, and set up this infrastructure? Is yeah, there totally. going to be, is it going to be reliable? Um, that makes a ton of sense there. Um, all right. Thanks so much, Ramon. I like that one. Um, let me see. Tyler here asked, do you have a projected revenue to purchase price ratio you want to see on a prospective property? I mean, typically, you know, and, and it's a little difficult, but uh, we want to see at least 20%, right? So for every $100,000 in purchase price, we want to see at least $20,000 in top line revenue. Um, and that that's a general rule of thumb. Um, most of our deals, I, I think, are doing better than that, but it's a, it's a good rule of thumb for you guys to use. All right. Uh, let's see here. What do we have? We got a couple already. Da, 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 da. Is there any reason to keep long-term rentals aside from SDRs? Are you 100% SDR right now, or, or do you still have some of those long-terms? We are 100% short-term rental. We sold off um, our, our long-term rentals. Eventually, we will get back into that space. Um, I, I like the idea of having a diversified portfolio. I think as our business continues to scale and grow, we will have a little bit of everything. I want uh, single family short-term rentals. I want hotels and motels. I want long-term rentals, probably more in the mid to large multifamily. If I do go back to long-term rental space, I want mm -hmm. self-storage. Um, I would love to have some commercial with like retail centers. 
Um, so eventually we do want to have a little bit of everything, but most investors, I think, shoot themselves in the foot because, and not just investors, entrepreneurs in general, because they suffer from shiny object syndrome. And every time they hear about this new strategy, they want to go test it out, right? They want to try this new thing and they prevent themselves from becoming the masters of one specific strategy. And my goal is to be a master at what I do in the short-term rental space. And once I feel I've achieved that, then we'll allow ourselves to kind of open up our purview and, and, and identify other investing strategies. So we will go back into the long-term rental space, but uh, we, we still have some more work to do on the short-term rental side first. Oh, that makes sense. Um, now, what was the next one? I just, I had a good one here. So Alfred, Alfred said that he's a big fan, Tony. So huge shout out to you. I'm a huge fan you, too, brother. by the way, Tony, you do some great work. Um, <laughs> so we went live recently with a new STR and are not yeah. getting as many bookings as we expected. It seems mm -hmm. to be a bit slower is, is some of the things I'm hearing right now, even though Airbnb per, had record profits in Q3, right. Um, right. hearing that bookings are, are, are hitting a bit of a lull, which we expect this time of year. Mm -hmm. But we've had it expertly designed, priced competitively in the 10th percentile, according to Price Labs. And we've completed the listing copy with as much detail as we can. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But any other tips to drive more bookings? Is there anything that you're doing in any of your areas to kind of bump up the uh, reservations that you're getting? Yeah. Um, first, uh, we, we have launched, uh, I think two properties we launched, uh, over the summer in Joshua, we've had the same kind of experience, right. Where we know everything we're doing, you know, we've done it for all of our other properties, but they, they've just kind of been slower to, to take in that market for whatever reason. Okay. Um, a, a couple of things that I would look at, and I would need to see the listing to really give you some detailed feedback. But the first thing I would say is like, think about what we talked about earlier in this conversation about the amenities piece. Like, can you add any additional amenities to the, that property to make it stand out? Okay. Um, like, for example, one of our properties in, in Joshua Tree, we are looking at converting the garage into a game room because we, nice. we did it at one of our other properties. We didn't do it at that property. We're noticing the other property is booking well. This one isn't booking as well. So we, we want to go back and make that adjustment. So we're doing that for that property that got off to a slow start. Um, like I said, pricing is always the thing that I want to try and compete on last. So can I update any amenities on the properties to, to make it more competitive? Um, the second thing you can do, and this is actually something that we, we actually are just now testing this. So I'll let you know if it actually works. Um, but we're, we're playing around with, um, the cleaning fees and the, uh, uh, the service fees. Okay. So Airbnb allows you to, um, eat the service costs. Right. So typically most hosts have it set up so that Airbnb takes 3% from your payout, charges the guests anywhere between 12 to 15 to sometimes 20% depending on your market. Right. Um, but you also have the ability to say, Hey, I'm just going to take the entire 15% out of my, mm -hmm. my payout. Now you don't necessarily need to eat that 15%. You change the, uh, you, you change your settings so that you take that 15%, but then you increase your ADRs by 15% yeah. to offset that. Right. So we're playing around with that. The other thing we're playing around with is uh, cleaning fees, right? So I don't know how much time you guys spend on TikTok, Airbnb, but all people do is complain about, like the guests, yep, all they yep. do is complain about the cleaning fees. Um, so for one of our listings, we completely remove the cleaning fee and we put that in the title, no cleaning fee. Um, and uh, we, again, increase our ADR just a little bit to try and offset that decrease in cleaning fee income. That way it kind of balances out. And we know how many bookings we typically get on a monthly basis. And if that holds true, here's kind of the lift in ADR we need to see for that to kind of balance out. Um, so those are some things we're playing with, right? You, you, you do kind of have to get creative. Yeah. The, the last thing I'll say, and this is a big one that we're focusing on is not just relying on the OTAs, Airbnb, Verbo, booking.com for all of your bookings. Um, when I look at some of the, the best performing properties in our markets, it's not necessarily that they're better than mine, but they've been marketed better. Mm. One of the best properties in Joshua Tree has 300,000 followers on Instagram. Wow. And they're booked out for months. So it's like, man, it, it's not always who's better, but it's who has more eyeballs. So a big focus for us as we move into 2023 is building out our direct booking platform um, and then really focusing on marketing those properties so that even if we, you know, we get a bad review and our, our, our listing tanks and the, the search results on Airbnb, we've still got, you know, 10, 50, a hundred thousand people on social that we can push this property to, to, to get it booked as well. So that'll, that'll be a really big focus for us next year is, is building out that, um, off platform booking. 
Yeah. And I think as we just continue to move on and there's more competition, people are looking for more, you really have to start marketing. It's not, you know, back in the day when it was just kind of set it and forget it, we just right. throw it out there and we know we're right. going to get reservations. And it's interesting what you talked about with the revenue, because I talk to people all the time who are concerned about the host only, hey, how do I do that when my nightly rate's going to be a bit more expensive than the next guy? Is that always a bad thing? Right. People aren't always looking for the cheapest option out there. Sometimes like people are looking to get some value. They're looking to get the most bang for their buck. So right. if your space is $15 more per night, that actually may attract a few more eyeballs because, hey, we're not looking at that person who's looking for the lowest rate. Um, and, I you mean, know, one and thing to go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say one, one little thing to add there, too, is, you know, you mentioned as much detail as possible. Could that be a bit of a concern? Do we have a bit too much information that people can't even get through the listing? And they're like, all right, I'm already turned off by it. Yeah. Um, but making sure you understand who are you targeting? What kind yeah. of traveler is coming to your space and speak to that traveler so that maybe you can have a bit more focus. And instead of just spray and pray, we can be a sniper out there and actually go ahead and take down some people who are looking to, to bring to our property. That's a great point about the uh, too much detail. I've seen some listings where it's like they they have almost their their house manual inside of their listing, you know? And it's like, why are you giving me the check, the checkout instructions that I haven't even booked your property yet? Right. So I think there, there is a fine line there. Um, but shoot, there was something else I was going to say. It'll come back to me. I'll remember it later. No worries. Well, we are out of time, Tony. This has oh, been one of go. my favorite ones that we've had here. You've given us so much knowledge and we, so I know these hosts are walking away with some great insights. Uh, some folks are going to be in and funding some investments. Some folks are going to be looking for some funding after this without a doubt. So, you know, thank you so very much. Any final words that you want to share with the audience? Uh, no, just uh, guys, thanks again so much for having me. Like I said, I'm I'm a true proponent of the software and we use it every day in our business and and the growth we've seen and the improvements we've seen have, have really helped us continue to scale. Um, and if you guys want to connect with me after this uh, on Instagram, I'm at Tony J. Robinson. Uh, if you guys want to follow me on uh, YouTube, it's at the Real Estate Robinsons there. Uh, Bigger Pockets Real Estate Rookie Podcast. Like I said, we, we put out two episodes a week there. And I've got a, a free download for everyone. It's a free ebook. Hopefully this is okay. It's not, it's not like Absolutely. they don't have to go pay for it. Um, but it's a, just go to alphahostacademy.com. And there's a, like a 10,000 page or 10,000 word, not 10,000 page, 10,000 word ebook uh, that we wrote that kind of details how we scaled from zero to like almost 30 units in, in two years. That's absolutely incredible. And yeah, if you want to share that link with us as well, we'll throw it in the email that we're sending out tomorrow uh, to let everybody know who had registered that we'll be we'll be uploading this on YouTube tomorrow. So you'll have access to it. Um, so you can take a look and and share it with your friends. Definitely a ton of knowledge here without a doubt. Um, so, you know, thanks again, Tony, for leading this amazing masterclass. Again, sharing so many of those great insights with our hosts. But most importantly, thank you all so much for joining us, being such an active audience. Your questions were great. I know, again, you're all walking out of here with some valuable knowledge. So here at Hospitable, we do love helping hosts streamline their business. We're a fantastic tool for those hosts looking to grow and scale, just get started. Um, you know, we help you generate some more revenue and more bookings. So if you're not a Hospitable host yet, you can check out our website, hospitable.com. Give us a try. We have a 14-day free trial uh, to get you hooked on the most easy-to-use vacation rental management tool in the industry. And I'll stand by that without a doubt. Um, so Daniel's going to share a free trial link in the comment box as well. Um, but you know, if you join, if you enjoyed tonight's event, join us next month for our next hospitable host workshop. So we're going to have three of our own hospitable hosts uh, who are going to share their experiences when it comes to handling emotional support and service animal requests, because that's a bit of a sticky one that comes in from time to time. So they're going to share experiences with you to help you go ahead and define your processes and know how to move forward. Uh, so that's all from me. Thanks again so much for joining us tonight. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, night, evening. I'm going to bed. Tony, man, thank you so very much. It was an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it, man. We'll see you guys soon. Sounds good, everyone. Ciao, ciao. Mm -hmm.